Hello, listeners, and welcome back to The Alicia Show. I am super happy to have Uma back with us. Uma was my second guest of The Alicia Show. So that was over 98 episodes ago. And now we are sitting here for episode 102. And I am so happy to have you back, Uma. Before we even jump in, I want to tell you how your previous episode impacts so many people. I have so many friends and family and listeners that send me messages and tell me how much that episode has truly helped them with their grieving process. And so I just want to thank you for firstly being my second guest, but also coming back for us to do this all over again and for just being so open and honest about your journey and how it impacted you to be able to impact others. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me back, Alicia. It's such an honor to be here. And my intention is to serve people through my own lived experience. Yes, That's what I love doing. And so it just warms my heart to know that The words I offered your listeners landed so deeply and is creating healing. So deeply, Uma, so deeply. Every time I go back to that episode, because I was a baby podcaster then, Mm -hmm. and I remember how you just held that space for me and how we talked about my own experience and how healing that was for me. And so I just wanted to have you back on the show to see how your world has changed over those last two years and just to get more from Uma, yeah, more healing well, vibes. Thank you for that. Yes, in the last two years, so we moved to Germany, my husband and I. We had just moved, I think, when we did the first interview, the earlier interview. So we've been here since August 2020, almost three years now. Transitioning to a new country has been really, really hard. We moved during COVID. And then we had this hard lockdown in Germany, which was really, it destabilized me in more ways than one because I didn't know anyone. I didn't have mm-hmm. friends, no connections. Yeah. And people aren't really willing to meet someone new when mm-hmm. they can't even meet their friends. I mean, who's going to show up and say, let's get coffee. Yeah. I'd love to meet a new friend. So the friendship landscape was completely barren. Mm-hmm. And that has been really hard. And even as things have opened up, one is able to get around. I haven't met too many people and it's probably not anybody's fault. It's just where I am in my own life. Yes. I happen to love solitude. I happen to love my own space. And I will also say I'm very selective about the kinds of friends I want in my life. So I guess it's a combination of all of that. Yeah. Did the solitude come from the pandemic? Did you enjoy your space previous to that? Or did you find that that was a newfound love per se? Mm, That's such a good question. So my husband has had a traveling job for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And back when we lived in Chicago, he used to travel overseas to Germany for three weeks. And I kind of enjoyed those weeks that I had the home to myself and I wake up and the bathroom was my own and the kitchen was my own. And mm-hmm. I, I did enjoy those moments. But I will say that when the pandemic hit and we were in San Francisco, he had a new job then. It was a very lonely time because, again, I found myself in a city where I was brand new. I didn't have friends. And I climbed the walls. Yeah. I kid you not. It was really hard for me because I actually like people. I enjoy people. And when the world shut down, we hadn't had anything like that before. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. was the first time we were being forced into solitude. When you choose solitude, it's a very different experience from when you're forced into it. And then you can't eat in a restaurant. You can't go to the library. Things that we enjoyed, even these minimal daily social interactions and connections were denied mm-hmm. to us. So that was really hard. And when we moved to Germany, that experience intensified because again I didn't have friends here initially I railed I ranted I cried 
I didn't like it. But over time, as I began to open to accepting this and seeing, okay, what's possible now that I'm not always in social circles, I really began to find that time opened up to read more books. I was listening to podcasts. I was writing. I wrote an entire book in this time. I've written my fourth book. Slowly, I began to realize that I am now not willing to be in friendship with just about anybody for the sake of friendship. That connection needs to be deep. I am a person that values deep conversations, heart conversations. I'm not into surface talk anymore. I'm going to be 60 next year. I don't have time for surface talk. If the right people don't show up, then I have to learn to befriend myself. And so I really think of our time in Germany as a time where I've had to befriend myself. Uma, we're not even 10 minutes in and you've just hit my heartstrings so deeply because I think I've let go of some friendships Mm -hmm. because of that. Like I don't have the time or the capacity for friendships that are not deep anymore as well. So hearing you talk and say that you had to befriend yourself, I resonate with that a lot because that's where I was as well. I had to really get with one with who I am and who I want to be in this world. And That's so thank right. you. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're welcome. Because think about it. You are going to be with you till the very end of your life. And if you can seek comfort and security and intimacy from within, I think that's the most sacred space we can all get to. Yeah. And that doesn't mean we don't need people because we are hardwired for connection and community. But we can be intentional about our friendships, like you just said. We can find and cultivate friendships that feel nourishing instead of draining, or that feel like I have to have friends, so I'm going to go have coffee with this person or lunch with this other person. But the friendship is because there's so much give and take. You know, what I'm finding more and more, Alicia, and I'd love to hear your experience with this, is that when I get together for coffee or lunch with somebody, What ends up happening is they talk about themselves for 10 minutes. Then I talk about myself for 10 minutes. And then they talk about themselves for five minutes. (laughs) There is no curiosity. There is no desire to ask questions. There's no desire to respond to what somebody just said. If somebody says, my brother went to college last week and I really, really miss him. We were so close. And you respond with, I remember what that was like when my sister went to college, but you know, we don't really get along. You've Mm -hmm. just completely invalidated the other person's experience. I would like to say, tell me more about your brother. It sounds wonderful, this connection that you had. I'd love to know a little more if you're open to sharing. And that invites the person into the conversation. I find that we've lost this skill, this ability to listen and ask questions and be invested in the other. Everybody's so interested in talking, in just sharing their experience. And to me, that feels deeply dissatisfying. Wow. See, that's so interesting because as a caregiver, as a coach, as a project manager, I have to listen and I enjoy listening. I enjoy building relationships with people. I think it's really important. And so I find it difficult when people don't want that back. Does that make sense? I have perfect sense. I have people that I have not spoken to in years or months who will be in my social media stories every day and they feel Mm. like they know who I am from that, but we've not spoken. I find that really intriguing that I have made it very intentional this year that I reach out to people. And I ask for coffee chats and I ask for telephone calls as opposed to text messages and DMs. And it's been interesting, the people who have said, I don't have time. And the people who were like, oh my goodness, I would love to. And so that's made it very easy for me to then be like, okay, I know where I need to pull back on some of my relationships. Because if you don't have time to pick up the phone when I've said that I'm free and let's have a meaningful conversation. If you don't have that time, then where is our relationship going? 
And so that's been really heartbreaking. Wow, I didn't know this was where we were going. But it's been really healing for me as well, because now I know that I don't have to or I don't want to keep on giving my energy to those relationships if you don't have time for me. Right. Because a true friendship is about reciprocity. Yes. There has to be give and take. If one person is doing, I hear on certain podcasts that friendships are changing and everybody is busy and we've got to be okay with not talking to somebody for months at a time. And then we pick up where we left off. It works with certain friendships, Mm -hmm. but I think just like we tend to a garden, just like we tend to people we support, like you said, your clients, We need to invest in friendships. We need to invest time. To me, that's important. Yeah. I was speaking to my godmother yesterday and I was saying to her, like when we grew up and I really want this for my daughter and I just need to find a way of being able to give this to her. But when we grew up, you know, holidays were taken care of because we had a community. Like my mum didn't have to worry about sending us to after school club because there was going to be an aunt or a godmother or somebody else. We were always in conversations with our cousins and our aunts and our friends and our families, they all kind of group together. But now there's no community, there's no values, there's no knocking on your next door neighbor for an egg or milk anymore. It feels like we're very disjointed mm-hmm. as a society, which is sad yeah. because I crave relationships. I speak to strangers all the time. That's who I am. And so That was what was hard for me, was people putting their head down or not making eye contact or not wanting to speak, who were very scared. That was very hard for me because I'm like, I am this happy-go-lucky person. You are. And Mm -hmm. I feel every word you're saying right now because I'm that kind of person too. And that's been the hardest thing Mm -hmm. about Germany because I don't know the language Mm -hmm. and people here aren't as friendly. It's just a cultural thing. I'm not saying they're wrong, but Mm -hmm. it's just not part of the culture to speak to strangers or smile at them. Mm. Younger people will, but the people that have grown here and, you know, they tend to be a little more reserved, stiff. Yeah, (laughs) reserved. Yes, that's right. You're right. We've lost the village because we are communicating through digital devices. Yes. And we've forgotten what it means to look into someone's eyes Mm. and listen to their words and receive their smile. We've forgotten that. It's very sad, but that's the truth. I am on a mission, Uma, to to try and bring some of that back into Mm. our circle, our family. Because like I said, my daughter is my only child. And so I want her to have that village. I want her to have a community. I want her to have extended friends and family and extended aunts and I want all of that, but I don't want that from a surface level. So true. Yeah. Yeah. What a beautiful mission that is, Alicia. And may they be more like you who bring the villages back to us. Wow. I hope so, because I just think otherwise a lot of us are doing the same things, but doing it in silo when we don't have to. Yeah. It doesn't have to be so hard. One of the questions I have for you is if it's, hard right now how will you change that for yourself I mean it's not nice being in a country lonely yes well we are heading back sometime this year back to Chicago I'm looking forward to that because I have my friends there my brother and his family are there my daughter is there so it feels like a happy situation Mm -hmm. that that will be upon us soon I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but I also quit all social media exactly one month ago. Yes. So we talked. And this is why I love this, because I reached out to Uma and I was like, can we have a chat? It's been a while. And it was the same day that you hit the button on social media. That's right. Yeah. And you were like, I'm done. I was so done because there's a few different reasons why I with social media. And I did a whole post to my newsletter community. And I did a podcast episode about it. But one of the main reasons was I felt that I wasn't honoring the content that I was creating and sharing on social media, because things that I was sharing, prime content that I was sharing with my one-on-one clients, I would generously offer it to my community there. 
And several members of my community are just darlings. I mean, they follow me through my newsletter now and have mm-hmm. remained in touch with me, for which I'm truly, truly grateful. But then you're also talking to a whole bunch of strangers who don't know you and who are swiping past everything you post mindlessly. Mm-hmm. Our attention spans are shrinking collectively. Mm-hmm. And so putting your content out there, sort of, okay, I'll just get some eyeballs on it. That's Mm -hmm. not a true honoring Mm -hmm. of my wisdom, is how I began to look at it. And I thought, I want to be more intentional about giving to the people that really want to learn from me, as opposed to just scattering gems to anybody. And that was one of the main reasons I got tired of creating content and being on there and chasing the likes and the hearts and the DMs and I finally decided I want to live a more intentional life. I don't want to be living my life on social media. And it's been one month since I quit. I've had so much spaciousness. I feel so calm inside. My nervous system is really relaxed. I get my work done in a couple of hours a day because I'm so focused and intentional. I'm not constantly checking my phone to see who liked my post or what should I say next or when should I post next. All those distractions have gone away. It's just such a wonderful feeling. I'm reading more. I'm writing more. It's funny because with social media, I dip in and out all the time. And I give myself permission to do that because like you, and I think we talked about this previously, I'm a huge empath. And so Mm. energetically, I see and I feel a lot. You know, one post can do a lot of you know, it can be happy, it can make me happy, or it can do a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I gave myself permission to do that. So I enjoy stories, I enjoy giving people updates that way. I hardly ever post to my grid. And I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. Because I just feel I'm honoring myself in that way. But what you said about being intentional, and live in a more intentional life. That really struck a chord for me because I think a lot of the time we can spend so much time on these little devices to the point where you're distracted. And I don't want my daughter to see us with a phone in our hands all of the time. And so I'm being more intentional from that perspective as well around her as well, because it's important. It's so important. So when you say you're living more of an intentional life, what are the things that now are really bringing you joy in that? One of the first things I noticed when I got off social media, we just returned from vacation. We were in Italy for a week. And for the first time, I clicked so few pictures on my phone. I only took pictures of what I wanted to take. I didn't take any food pictures. You know, there was no, I have to share this on social. I have to share this with my community. There was none of that urgency, none of that pressure. Mm -hmm. So I found myself being very relaxed with my phone. Okay, I don't need a picture of that. Okay, that one, I like the light there. I'll take a picture of that. Again, very intentional Mm -hmm. about how I'm doing what I'm doing. The other things that bring me joy, I read a lot. And for some reason, the book that got me to think about leaving social media was one called Digital Minimalism by Mm -hmm. Cal Newport. So I loved that book. I read it like a thriller and it felt very urgent to leave social media once I was through reading that book. Wow! And I'm now very interested in what social media and digital devices are doing to our attention spans Mm -hmm. and how we can reclaim our focus. So the book that I'm currently reading is a book called Stolen Focus. Okay. Which is again, really, really interesting. So I'm really, I feel drawn to read more about almost like I'm affirming my own decision. Yes. I'm saying, yeah, I'm glad I did this. It was for all the right reasons. And I also want to educate people about how they show up for their digital devices. You know, how it doesn't mean everybody has to get off social media, but it's about thinking about your relationship with your phone thinking about your relationship with social platforms and saying, am I mindlessly giving all of my time and attention to this space? Or can I find ways to be more intentional about it? So that's one of the things I'm finding drawn to reading books about attention spans and how can we reclaim our focus and do the deep work we came here to do. 
The other thing is I love walking by the river. It always brings me joy. We live seven minutes away from the Rhine River. Yes, I loved your I'm post. There, so I'm there walking every day. That's something I enjoy. I love a spacious morning. I just love a spacious morning. I sit down, I make my lemon water. That's how I start my day. Me too. And then I have a meditation session. I write in my gratitude journal. And then I sit down with a book that I find inspiring. So right now I'm reading Stolen Focus. Sometimes it could be something spiritual, self-help. Sometimes it's a novel. Sometimes I'll challenge myself to read a novel first thing in the morning because it's my way of saying I deserve to read what I want. It doesn't have to be non-fiction. It doesn't have to be something I'm studying for work. It doesn't have to be something related to client work. If I want to read a novel, I'm jolly well going to read a novel. I love that. I love that you do that first thing as well, because you're stacking your day up for you first. Yeah, me first. Yeah, I love that. And then everything else comes afterwards. Everything else comes afterwards. Because by then, I am connected with source energy, with the divine, with God. I can't think of starting my day without talking to God and saying, use me. That's my favorite prayer. Use me for the highest. And also consciously saying, remind me to stay in my lane. Trust that you'll take care of what you need to take care of. I love that so much. In terms of you finding healing and living more of an intentional lifestyle from leaving social media, did that mean that you pivoted your business in any way or changed how you did things in your business? Well, I have had a blog for about 10 years now, Mm -hmm. and I have been posting fairly religiously. So I'm going back, and it's perfect timing because Mercury retrograded today, I think. So it's a good time to review, revisit. Yes. I'm going and looking at the blogs that are very old and deleting them. I'm changing up the titles to make the keywords pop when someone does a Google search. My assistant is setting up all my stuff on Pinterest which is a search engine. Yes. And then I have my podcast. So that's been the newest thing, which I started the podcast in January, Mm -hmm. end of January, not even knowing that I was going to be off social media by the end of March. Mm -hmm. I had no clue. I wasn't thinking about it. It all happened very quickly. Mm -hmm. But it was so perfect that the divine set that thing up. So I now have a way to talk to my people and share stories from my life and teach and inspire through this podcast which was already in place before I left social so in terms of my content I'm doing the same four systems which is healing from loss healing generational trauma soul purpose mentoring and human design these are my four systems that I'm currently working with and I guide my clients and teach on these four systems so it's just getting off social media has just meant that I've had to find other ways to reach my people. And it's probably a little slower, but I'm willing to be patient because I trust that what's meant for me will come to me. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point because it's not a sprint. Like I know that's a bit cliche, right? But it's not, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And so sometimes we're sprinting along thinking that we can use social media to expand our businesses like yesterday and not building in an intentional way in an organic way and Mm. then we get upset about the fact that we haven't grown overnight and we let that suck our energy as well so I am here for everything that you just said about being off it and not having it as your main focus Mm. and I mean you are then really intentionally finding those clients that really are interested and want to work with you and not just about the results. They're about who Uma is. That's such a good point you mentioned, Alicia. I also want to add to that and say that to me, this feels like more receptive feminine energy, letting people find me organically. And so they come to me instead of using the masculine energy of showing up on social media and hustling and trying to find clients. Yes. Right here, I'm sitting, I'm doing my thing, I'm sending out a blog every week, I'm sending out my newsletters, recording my podcast episodes, and I'm letting people find me. 
So I'm being generous with my wisdom and information and inspiration, but the job of coming to me for someone mm-hmm. to say, I really like how she talks about this thing. I want to work with her or I want to just get on a 30 minute call and see what she's about. Yes. I mean, that's for them to come to me. It feels much more anchored in my feminine essence. I love that. I love that. I love that you said that it feels more anchored because I think over the last two years, I have really been focusing on working with my feminine energy as well and just Mm. and talking about that as well on the podcast through my course and so forth because I think it's really important a lot of us Mm -hmm. have been told and taught to really use our masculine energy to get what we want in this life and we've shut down all of our feminine energy which really intuitively is what we need that's who we are and our intuition and source and god and these are the people and this is the feelings that are telling you what you need do you know what you need within but because you're listening to all of the other people and voices and so forth out there you're not trusting Mm -hmm. right so important to remember that because our world is just getting noisier and the noisier it gets the more we outsource our wisdom Yes. then, like you said, <laughs> we're not tuning into what's right for me. How do I want to do this? What do I think about this? Yeah. We are picking up on other people's opinions and ideas and yes. inspiration and churning it out. It goes against the grain of who we came here to be, our unique blueprint, right? Our soul Love blueprint. That. Yes, yeah. our soul blueprint. So that's quite a nice segue to talk about the human design. Okay, because I think, again, Mm -hmm. we touched upon this and I was like, I need to get Uma back on to talk about this because, yes, I am so intrigued. And I think when we had our conversation offline, we talked about human design for children as well. And I was like, I need to do this for Alessandra because it's in the forefront of who we are. And we're not using our own gifts because we don't know about them because, again, we've not been taught to use them. Right. Human design, knowing human design, finding human design has really changed the way I live life, the way I do life, because it tells me who I came here to be, how my energy works, how I manage stress, how I deal with my emotions, what kind of energy I'm most vulnerable to, to taking in from other people, and what are my strengths, what am I meant to focus on, what am I here to give out to the world? And how do I receive from the world? So it gives us so much information about who we are. That's why I call my human design reading your soul's blueprint. Yes. Because it really is. And one of the things that I have always been passionate about from the time I started doing grief work, working with clients, helping them heal their grief, is there's this tendency in the wellness space and the spirituality space to speak about grief and loss as being people When they cross over, you're always connected with them and your soul knows their soul. And we go into these platitudes, Mm. which are not very helpful when someone's grieving. So I've always been sort of a champion for the human aspect of grieving. Like feel your feelings, cry, rage. You get to have all your feelings. I've been like sort of a champion for this. And what I love about human design is that it tells you who you are as a human And it tells you what your divine gifts are, what your purpose is. So the combination, the intersection of the two is what I find fascinating. I cannot wait to do mine. I keep on telling Uma that I'm ready, but I'm not ready. because I need to just find out the time that I was born. And it's quite difficult because mum's not here anymore. Okay. And I still can't find my birth certificate. So I need to continue to look for that. But I cannot wait because it just fascinates me. I've had numerology done and that was interesting to me. But to know more about who I am, I think it's important because like you said, we can get so distracted in what everybody else thinks about us. Yeah, that's so true. And what I find fascinating is when I do couple readings, readings for couples, I can actually now show them instead of just telling them, oh, you're an extrovert, he's an introvert. No wonder you're going to have challenges. There's a human design body graph, which is the human design chart. And I get them to look at their shapes, the configuration in their individual charts. And I say, see, your throat center is defined. So you're here to be very vocal. You communicate masterfully. 
and your throat center is undefined, which means mm-hmm. you don't have consistent access to speaking, to expressing. There are times when you'll know exactly what to say and want to say it, and it'll be the right moment to say it. But there are times when the wisest thing you can do is to just listen or create space for the other's conversation. So you actually get two people to see how differently they're configured and how wonderful it is that when they follow their unique design, they can operate at their highest. Yeah. What a gift to be able to give because a lot of the times there is that internal conflict sometimes. Yes. But to know that this person is not doing it because they just want to be difficult, but this is actually part of their human makeup, that would save so many marriages as well, right? That's right. I had one of my clients walk away from this session. She came into the session being really angry and upset with her Mm -hmm. spouse. And I said, let's look at his human design. Mm -hmm. So she got me the information and the reasons why they were in conflict with each other was communication. Yes. You know, one tends to want be more outdoorsy. The other one wants to stay home and is more retiring. And I said, let's look at your human design charts. When we finished the session and I showed her how different her husband's chart is from hers, she emailed me to say, it's the first time I've been able to touch that deep sense of compassion for him. Because it's not his fault that he doesn't want to do what I want to do. It's the way he's made. And she said, just looking at his chart and hearing you speak to his strengths and his challenges really helped me to gain and shift my perspective on that. So it's such a gift. Yeah. You've just made me think about my brother, Jordan, and maybe I should get this Mm. done for him as well. Okay. So yeah, we'll talk about that as well, because that, wow. Yeah, I didn't know that I need that extra pause to think about that. Because in our house, sometimes communication is hard, especially as you know, Jordan's on the spectrum. He's on the autism spectrum as well. I'm not looking for you to tell me magically that this will be able to communicate this way. But but it would be really interesting to know about his makeup a little bit more from who he is as a person. And so thank you for just even giving me that example, because that is the reason why we have these conversations, right? Uma, like for me, this is heartfelt. Like this is us having a conversation with great meaning because now I'm going to take that back into my family and I'll be able to say like, I can do this to help in my family. So thank you. I also want to touch upon your new book because you slid Mm -hmm. that in. And you're like, yeah, I've written my fourth book. So I want to go back to your fourth book and I want to talk about what it's about. And yes, give me all the details. Yeah. So the manuscript is tentatively titled Sacred Fire. It's a marriage memoir. My husband and I have been married for, it'll be 32 years next month. The memoir is about a marriage story, okay, Mm -hmm. in a nutshell. It asks the question, what happens when two people who love each other dearly, respect and care for one another, how do these two people navigate a marriage, a long-term marriage, when they're walking very different soul paths? So when my mother died, as you know, my life fell apart and fell back together again. And the way it fell back together again, the mosaic of who I became bore little resemblance to who I used to be. And that confused my husband completely. Mm -hmm. He said, who are you? I mean, I don't know this person. Mm -hmm. This is not not the person I married. But I had to walk that path. There was this voice inside of me that was screaming at me to serve. And I was unable to ignore that voice. And I had to keep going. I didn't know where the path was leading. But I trusted that the way knew the way. And my job was just to keep walking. And so that created dissonance in our marital relationship because almost immediately my husband became the sole breadwinner. Our daughter was getting ready to go to college Mm -hmm. and you know universities in the U.S. are exorbitant and here I am saying I don't know why I'm saying this but I just need to serve. That's what my soul wants to do Mm -hmm. and when I look back on that time I don't even know how we got through it. There were a lot of long silences and He didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand why he didn't understand Understand. me, which of course I now I do. It's not possible for a type A personality, very intellectual, reasoning, rational type of person to understand things like, you know, my soul wants me to serve. (laughs) Yes, yes. (laughs) Right? 
Well, that was in 2009. So we've come a long way. But mm-hmm. even so, the nature of the relationship has had to change. It has had to accommodate for both our differences. And I don't end the memoir with any kind of, you know, it's not like a story with tied up with a pretty little bow. Yes. Because the marriage is still in progress. Right. But I talk about, I guess I end the whole story by saying that we can only expand our capacity to feel all of it. Mm-hmm. Some days grief is greater and yeah. other days gratitude is greater, but yeah. they coexist. It's not one or the other. I'm very grateful for everything we have. And at the same time, there's also the grief of what's no longer possible because the flavor of the marriage the shape of the marriage has had to change because I changed. And over the years, because I changed, he has had to change. We're doing a different steps in the dance now. That's really what the exploration of the book is. It's about how do two people live together for 32 years? And there's still a lot of mutual love and respect and trust, but we want very different things. We're looking at very different horizons. Wow. How vulnerable for you to put that all down onto paper and to share with the world has he read it he hasn't read it I'm about to send it to him because I've still been editing it and I just got done recently but he will definitely read it I mean there's no way I will publish it without oh, no, giving him a yeah. manuscript but you're right it was heartbreaking this book has been on my heart for close to I'm gonna say eight nine years and it only got written in the last year so that tells you how much I had to overcome in terms of the vulnerability piece in order to become brave enough to sit and write the story. Because I believe that there are so many women like me out there in the world. And these women need to hear this message. We read so many books about, so many memoirs about how marriages break and some marriages are destined for that. I have no judgment on that. But I haven't read too many stories on what it takes to make a long-term marriage work and keep working when there are all these difficulties and challenges. Wow. Like, wow. The reason why I took that long pause is is because my husband and I, we had a separation. And like you said, it took a lot to come back together. And so thank you for acknowledging how hard it can be and how difficult it is when you've got two people who are growing in different lanes, but still want to be together. Exactly. Ooh, Uma, I did not know I was going to share yeah. that. <laughs> oh, wow. I want to talk more about that with you now, but we'll do that offline. Yes. Yeah. But this was before Alessandra was born. This was just before my mom passed away. And we got back together after my mom passed away. Wow. But I think, again, it's, important that we discuss these conversations because there are a lot of people out there who as you said no judgment maybe in situations where they don't want to stay or maybe in situations where they do want to stay but they don't know how and I just happen to be very fortunate that I'm married to a man who's very devoted and committed to me he has always given me the freedom to walk my path he didn't understand it, but he never once said, you don't get to do that or you can't do that Mm -hmm. because I don't know if I would have stayed if that had been the case, you know? So when someone honors who you are, Mm -hmm. is willing to honor your authentic being, even though he doesn't have a freaking clue why you (laughs) become this person. Yes. I still have so much respect and adoration for him for that reason. And I will not sugarcoat it. There are difficult days even now. Even now, there are difficult days you know, when the grief is greater than the gratitude, like I said. Yes, I really like that saying. I really resonate with that saying. And I feel very grateful that I'm in the same position as you are, where my husband is like, go, go do you. Be happy. I'm not going to not let you do that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Yes. Very loved and supported. So I'm in awe of you because you said this is your fourth book. Last year, I co-wrote a book and just a chapter and that took a lot. And Mm -hmm. so whilst you were talking, I've had a book in me for the last six years after my mom passed and I started and I stopped and I started and I stopped and just hearing you talk throughout this conversation 
has really inspired me to pick up the pen again and be intentional about just carving that time out to write. So thank you. So many lovely takeaways for me here. I hope you'll write that book because these stories need to be told. Every loss is different. How we experience these losses are so different. And you will have a community of readers that need your book. Sometimes we go to this place of so many books have been written on grief and loss. What am I going to do? Add one more to that collection? No, no one has lived your story and no one will tell it the way you do through your filter. And your people are waiting for your book. Thank you for saying that. Oh, Uma, this has been amazing as I knew it would be. You just have this air about you that just makes me feel so comfortable. And like I said, I didn't know I was going to open up like I did. I think I said that the last time you that, did, yeah. <laughs> that we talked. So <laughs> nothing has changed. I am super happy that we have been able to do this again and that we stay in contact. And I'd like for us to continue to do that because I believe that you are a person that I want to build a intentional relationship with. So thank you for showing up today for me, because I know that this conversation again is going to be listened to and felt by so many others, just like your first episode was. So thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, that means so much to me, Alicia. I feel the same way about you. Mm -hmm. I would love to build an intentional friendship with you as well. So let's keep the coffee chats going. Yes, let's. And stay connected. Thank you so much for having me over again. When you and I talk, it just feels like two sisters connecting. Right? That really warms my heart. So before we go, can you tell the listeners where they can find you and your services? Tell us a little bit more about your services. Yeah. So right now, the best place to find me is my website, umagirish.com. My podcast is called Being Fully Me. It's on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And I just wrapped up season one. So it's only 10 episodes. You can yes. catch up. It's not too late before I start recording season two episodes. This is an episode where I share stories from my life. I share what I'm thinking about, what I'm living through. So it's just, I try to keep it authentic, real, and just, yeah, share myself there too. So those are the best places to find me and stay in touch with me. I would love to listen to season one. So I will be putting that on my podcast list. Thank you. Good. Okay, listeners, thank you so much for joining us today for a very intentional conversation with the wonderful Uma. You will find all of Uma's details in the show notes. And also I will link in our previous episode. So you have the details of that. And I just want to say thank you all for continuing to listen. I am so grateful for you. And if there is somebody who needs to hear this episode, then please share it with your friends and your family, because I do believe that these conversations are really life-changing. Okay, take care for now. Bye. Thank you.